It's Carlos, and I'm the founder and CEO of Product School. And I'm here with Johnny Bufar Hat, who is the CEO and founder of Hopin. Hey, Johnny. Hey, Carlos. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. I think first time I heard of you was last last year, way before the pandemic. Uh, my good buddy Andre Husit, who's the CEO of, of Miro, he said, "Hey." check these guys out. They're building something really cool. I think it would be interesting for some online events. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds interesting. And now, boom, here you are. Yeah, um, definitely a roller coaster since then. So tell me a little bit more about your own personal story first. I want to learn more about who you are as a founder and what inspired you to build Hopin. So around four years ago, I um, I was I had just graduated. Well, about five years ago, I graduated university, and uh, I, while in uni, I, I had made an app, sold it for a little bit of money. Before that, I was uh, I was uh, I, I taught myself to code when I was a kid, so I was always playing a little bit with apps. What happened was I uh, I got uh, about four and a half years ago an autoimmune disease. Uh, after traveling, um, I returned home, took a lot of, uh, uh, with a food poisoning that led to an autoimmune disease after taking a lot of auto, uh, antibiotics. So what, what happened was I spent two years literally trying to recover. But in that time when I was sick at home, I wanted to connect with people and people in the company always joke that it's like, a, we went full circle because now other people are stuck at home and also needed to connect with other people. And that's where Hoppin kind of came from. So literally two years ago. I was trying to connect with people and um, um, and I built this product that allowed people to connect from the comfort of their own home. And that's literally uh, how we got to Hopin. And, and, and that's where my story got to here. As soon as I had gotten myself into remission, I have a very strict diet now. Uh, I was able to uh, raise some money in November uh, when we spoke, Carlos. And since then, we've uh, literally been just running at full pace well, i'm glad you're feeling you're feeling well first of all and uh you guys are crushing it i remember when first time we spoke you were around 30 people max so tell us a little bit more about what hoping is and and a little bit of the scale of your team absolutely so yeah I, I, we were <laughs> we were uh when you spoke with me i think it was uh, you know, uh, not many people, uh, you know, and now we're, we're not many at all, like uh, uh, under 20, I think, or 30. We are now uh, 200 people in that short period. And we've got uh, in 34 different countries, um, you know, and, and, and we've also, you know, uh, many big customers across the world and uh, also for hosting, hosting different types of events. So we've had like NATO, the United Nations, uh, corporates like the Wall Street Journal and uh, um, you know uh, Slack run events with us, but we've also um, we've also had smaller events like workshops uh, for for uh, ran by local local people and also uh, comedy events and, and, and etc. And I would say uh, my my experiences over these last uh, the last year has been really intense with uh, you know working. Uh, we've been literally just hiring. Most of the time I spend as a founder is hiring now. And so I would say, and I'm sure you went through that same phase, uh, you know, uh, hiring is 80% of the job and the other 20% is product. So what is your background? Take, take me about, take me to the early days of hoping. How did you build the very first version? Uh, okay. So I, I, like I said, I was a coder since I was, um, since I was, uh, since I was young, but I would say I, I'm going to give you the wrong advice for most people. Actually, I think it's the right advice. Some people will say it depends on where, where what type of product ma uh, product person you are. So Hopin version one, which is pretty much the same features that you'll see today, just they're you know we've optimized them significantly, was purely on gut intuition. Uh, I was looking. I thought about what do I think people want from a virtual events. Uh, platform and I started building features that made sense of it. So you're talking about, uh, for those of you who don't know what Hopin does, virtual event platform. And I think that was your first question, which I, I just leaned off the answer to. Um, you know, it, 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 we have it, it. The easiest way to explain it would be a, a venue space online. So if you think of uh, a virtual um, conferencing platform such as uh, Skype or Zoom or whatever else. 
They're great for up to 20 people, but Hopin allows you to go from 20 to 100,000 as an event. And how it does that is by breaking out the online event into different areas. So maybe instead of just having one session, you can have 20 sessions in one event and each of them with different functions. So maybe a stage for your keynotes, a session area for smaller workshops and expo to sell uh, or show your sponsors off, et cetera. Uh, if that would be obviously for a con uh, conference, but for whatever else. And so that was, that's actually how I created the product. I thought about what would a platform that allows you to create any event, any event you want or any venue, a venue look like. So everybody's been building these platforms, like a webinar is just like a live stream with a registration paywall on top of it or uh, of, of some sort, it's a webinar. And our, our thought was, uh, you know, how do you actually, I attend all these things, but I don't actually network. How do you network with people at these events? And then, so we built the stage, which was very similar to a webinar. And then the session area was, okay, we want people to network. So we built the networking area, which is like a chat roulette in the event that you can customize uh, as an organizer. And then we built sessions for workshops. And then we thought, okay, uh, my thought was, everybody's asking for a way to monetize their sponsors. We need some sort of an expo area where you can go see the sponsors, buy in, because that's where most people make their money through events. Uh, either through tickets or through Expo. And that's literally how the products, uh, we just listen to what the customers want and we build uh, we build out features in that way. And I remember when, when we had our first conversation, that, that was what got me excited about your product because I agree with you. Most of the products out there are focused on replicating the experience of the stage, literally live streaming the speaker. But there were very few options out there focused on the backstage or the hallway, like where the magic really happens between people. So if you really want for them to engage with each other. Otherwise, they are just going to listen to whatever someone is saying. So I remember we started geeking out. You showed me the product. I was like, this is this is lit. Like, I I mean, I, I couldn't predict it was going to be that, that big, but I'm so proud of you. And and I'm also wondering now with all the pandemic going on and, and your uh, funding round and all the, the exponential growth that you guys are getting, how did that impact your roadmap? So it allowed us to build much quicker. I think anyone who says that funding is uh, a one-way street in terms of like, it just makes you a success, I would say, no, totally not. Actually, it adds a lot of pressure and it makes, makes you have to move faster, which adds to your success. I think speed is the number one important thing as a company. I think speed is, uh, allows you, uh, and, and speed of execution and quality of execution is the most important thing. And so money allows you to do that with fundraising. So our product features, instead of implementing them in three months, our goals were to implement them in one month because we had enough to hire good people and start spreading out. But then it brings organizational structures that need to change because as you know, you can't throw 500 people to fix one light bulb. It won't change the speed of the, of the light bulb. It's about setting up those organizations uh, <clears throat> within the company to make people move faster. <clears throat> And then for you personally, I can imagine the transformation as a, as a founder and CEO of a small team to now running an, an enterprise of 200 people. Personally, how have you invested in your own growth? Um, so I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I don't do as much as I should. Most people at my stage would have a coach. I have almost got a coach, but I've been so busy that we haven't had a, I, I set up two calls. I, so. Um, you know, I, I, most of my, most of my learning comes from other founders in the space. If you are an entrepreneur out there that wants to, um, wants to meet people, other founders are usually very friendly and open. I'm, I remember Carlos, even our first conversation, you were like, anything you need from me, ask me any questions. And that's t tends to be it. Founders usually give back and want to give advice and help. So I get a ton of advice from founders in the space. And that's really how I've learned the majority of the stuff. And now you mentioned that you, you had to hire a bunch of people, but you're right. Like, it's not just about getting the money to go out and, and hire. It's really setting up the process and making sure that you are, you're really getting the best for what you need. So how do you guys go about hiring? I guess you are a remote organization, but is there any other key criteria you, when you decide to bring someone on board? Our, we have some key culture points. N number one is proactive. We need people to be proactive. When you're moving this fast, you, you get tons of holes in a business uh, when you're higher, when you're moving this fast, when your company's growing at the pace that has been growing, it means that we didn't get to, we didn't spend two years setting up 
all these processes. We have to do it very quickly. And so there's a lot of holes in the process and you need someone who's proactive who can go and fill those holes as they see them. And, and so number one thing we look for is proactive people, people that can go and go beyond the extra mile. Number two um, is low ego. Uh, it's a company profile, like, you know, uh, from, from day one. We don't want people that are, uh, have a big ego. We want low ego that are, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, wear humility, uh, because I think that's what, that's what, uh, causes problems in the company. You know, people that are looking out for their egos and not for themselves or their company. And so, uh, those were the two major things we looked for. And the third, which is an additional for us is, and it just happens naturally is international. We want people that are international and can understand, uh, you know, what we mean by that is, you know, wherever you are in the world, there's an advantage to have, ha having you. Uh, because the more you've seen or the different things that you've seen add a lot of value in the event space because you, we need to know what people are hosting everywhere and they're all different. That's so true because, yeah, there is there's so many types of events. You're really building a platform for any kind of event anywhere in the world. Literally, literally. So how do you think about the, the future of online events? Just from my own experience, we host a bunch of events. Uh, we do around thousand uh, small webinars and then six big conferences. And I've seen many other companies now saying, oh, we're doing an online conference just because let's put together four speakers and, and, put, and you know, talk. Um, I think there's a lot of room for learning, just in general, for everyone who wants to put together a, an online conference. But I'm curious to know from your perspective, where do you see this going? I don't, I, I think com, uh, people are getting more value from online conferences than physical. I think there's, uh, there's a problem here. So there is the experiential market. So for example, a lot of people go to an event like uh, Web Summit, mainly to get, uh, you know, it's to connect with other entrepreneurs, but also you get drunk, you eat, you know, you, know, you, you eat food with people, you make new friends. It's an experience. Those sort of events we think will move hybrid. And what we mean by hybrid is there'll be people watching online who will be able to network, be able to get the content they want but are too busy or don't want to fly over and spend five days and waste that time there. Uh, similar to a CEO like yourself, Carlos, or myself, or anyone else who's just, you know, maybe you're in school, you just, you don't, you don't want to spend that much, you don't want to fly over there, all that sort of stuff. And there'll be, a, 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 and so companies will want to, value that market on top uh, uh, for the hybrid, so online, and they will also have people who are attending physically. Organizers and attendees will prefer to have both. Now in the online event space, <clears throat> purely online events we think are gonna become more and more experiential. With VR, uh, you know, in the next 10 years, if you're talking long-term, and VR and AR allowing us to do pretty much the same things uh, that we do phys uh, physically online, but in the short term, uh, we also think that people will be adding, looking for more and more experiences. We see it now all the t uh, all the time. Uh, people integrating things like Kahoot or games within Hopin uh, to run, uh, for example, a, a show and tell, a comedy show. Uh, um, you know, turning the uh, session into a Miro board so everybody can, which we integrate with, or or a watch party. We see a lot of that sort of stuff. So we think that across the space, uh, virtual events are just going to become bigger and bigger online events. Uh, and, 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 and that's where our features are going to, integrations. We want tons of integrations. So if you're running a, a product workshop, then you should be able to use Miro board altogether and inside one event and while other things are going on. I think that's a good point. I actually didn't think about it, like all these different use cases beyond the professional conferences. Like you mentioned a watch party or a comedy show. Why not? Exactly. And integrations, I think it's a really good point. I, I personally use Hoping for our conferences and we were ex experimenting with, you know, different add-ons to create a Q&A session for people or to create an actual working session, as you mentioned, on a whiteboard so people can actually collaborate. Those are literally the highlights of our conferences because it's almost when when our audience feels closer to the rest of the audience. I 100% agree with you. And, and that's what it is. It's audience engagement. That's what, that's what keeps people connected with your brand and uh, provides more value. So we're seeing organizers get way more value from their online events than they are from the physical. 
not per person that shows up, but it's because so many more people show up that you didn't, you wouldn't have had that level of engagement before. You wouldn't have got, uh, you know, if you're running an event in San Francisco, you don't usually get people from uh, Jakarta attending, but online you can get tons of people from wherever they are uh, attending from all over the world. I agree. And I think we, we all have to rethink as an industry, what are the success metrics? Because uh, we tend to focus too much on a high level number of people who are SVP for an event, but how many people actually showed up or did something and found value? Absolutely. And on that note, we released a blog post, um, you know, this is a, a quick plug in, but uh, <laughs> you know, we released a blog post saying that, uh, showing that for Hopin statistic, because we offer people networking, if they attend, if you host an event on Hopin, there's usually a networking aspect, et cetera. People, uh, we have a, across Hopin events total, there's an 83%, uh, no, 73% turnout rate versus uh, industry wide for webinars, 22%. That's huge. I can tell you from experience, that's pretty big. <laughs> so in terms of your own product, because as you evolve, how do you, how do you structure it? Like, tell me a little bit more about how you guys think about product. Do you have different products within hoping? Yeah, so we do. Uh, we, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. So we see each section of Hopin. So if you Hopin as a vir uh, is a, a virtual events platform. But we have a marketplace now, which we're launching in the next week or so, and that has its own product manager. We have a, um, uh, a each area, so we have, we call it the organizer dashboard, everything that the organizer experiences. We have an organizer product manager there. We have a sponsor's product manager to focus on the sponsor's experience, We have or vendor's experience. We have an events product manager to focus on inside the events. We have tons of different or product owners. We have tons of different product owners running these different segments of the product. And that's how our organization has, uh, has, has kind of scaled out with these, uh, we call them product pods of, let's say four engineers, a, pro a designer and a product owner, all working on a specific problem uh, or, or, or po part of the com uh, company. And now these pods have just grown and grown and they kind of get smaller and bigger and then you know you add uh, a hierarchy on top but that's really how we see the product and that allows us to get a lot more focus because each individual work each individual pod begins to work like a a startup and when that happens uh, you get tons of value because people are now able to uh, scale up or, or focus on one problem and uh, you know each area gets a long-term plan, a short-term plan, a mid-term plan, rather than when you consider the platform as a whole, you might forget some of these areas if you have a big org like that. I find that super interesting. And I think it's very relevant for the audience to recognize that it's not just one single product. Yes, you may have a huge platform, but you are dissecting it into different products so you can be agile enough and really understand how to how to balance the different initiatives that you want to create in order to achieve those high level goals. Because if you just go too big since the beginning, something you are going to have to tr sacrifice something. Like you mentioned vendors experience. Like so I made that mistake in the past, building something that tries to be too big. And then someone, there are so many different use cases and personas using your own product that you almost need someone advocating for each of them. Absolutely. There's, there's knockbacks and there's benefits sometimes it's better because when you have someone overlooking the whole thing or everybody knows what's going on, it means that people can work on different features, but there's so many benefits and pros, uh, pros to it that it ends up outweighing the negatives. And the, all, the main negatives I would say of it, just to be completely transparent, is that, like I said, people focus too much on one part of the pro uh, platform and build product, build stuff for that without thinking about the rest, if they're focused on it for too long. But uh, but it's, it just allows things to move, like you said, Carlos, so much faster. So, Yoni, what are the things that you are still personally involved in because you love so much and you still can influence versus what are all the things that you think it's better to delegate? So I would say it really depends on you as a founder. Um, I'm product oriented. I built the initial product, so I stay as close as I can to the product. I have a philosophy around it. I may be wrong, but... Uh, that's where I where 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 I sit most of the time. Uh, so for me, most of my job today is uh, speaking with customers, speaking with uh, investors a little bit, recruitment, 
and working on product. Um, and recruitment, obviously, is hiring and exciting people to the job. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, but other founders maybe get it a little bit deeper into different things, maybe don't get involved in product and leave it to their team who are have more time and have more creativity. But and, and, and those are, you know, it really depends on who you are as a founder. But for me, I definitely focus most on the product. I, I, I had a hunch. Uh, me too. I had that type of bias. And uh, most of the, the founders and, and uh, we have here on the whole, on the podcast, they, they have that type of bias towards product. I think it's critical, um, especially in the early days, because at the end of the day, that's the resume of your company. And uh, you have strong opinions. Obviously, I, I can imagine that you have to balance that with the product leaders that you bring on board to make sure that they also feel empowered. So I'm, I'm curious, is there, um, you guys have a, a chief product officer or VP of product that can help you kind of run the strategy? Uh, no, we don't actually. Uh, we've been looking at whether or not, uh, so we are now looking for a VP of product or a chief, a chief product officer. We hadn't had one and now we're looking. It took me so many years to feel comfortable with that decision because I mean, to this day, I think it's still where that had for most of the time. And it's hard because it's your baby. I was very easy to, it was very easy for me to convince me that I had to delegate other parts of the business, but, but probably so close to my heart. I can imagine. Yeah, we, uh, I, I share the same uh, uh, with you. I try, I, you know, you, you, what I've noticed is uh, that that's actually the biggest thing, Carlos, that you brought that up. I think founders are usually the biggest blockers in their businesses. I, I think across everything. I think, you know, when I when we were, I think that's why I hop and moved a little bit faster than everyone else because I got a lot of advice. You know, I, I know a lot of founders that, uh, you know, they have a good business, but it's just them. And it took them three years to begin hiring and moving fast. Um, and uh, because they were worried about delegating. Delegating is the number one way to move fast and the number one way to... Um, you know, level up as a founder. If you can't delegate, you're never going to be able to move at the pace that you want to move at. Absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a great point. We should definitely organize another talk just to talk about delegating as a founder, because it's such a big issue, right? And uh, it takes time, maturity, get rid of your ego, fail, and many other things before you realize, okay, <laughs> this is, I mean, if I cannot do this by myself, that there's no physical way. There's only 24 hours per day and there is your health. So if you really want to go long, you need a team. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. So you guys are remote first, right? When you started the business? Yeah, we are remote first. Absolutely. Uh, we started remote first and obviously coronavirus has kept us remote first. <laughs> so what are some of the... Um, I would say tools or tricks that you use to have a 200 people remote team that is synchronized. We use Slack actually like our workplace is Slack. I mean, we are, I, w I wish we had some, we use Slack, we use Notion, we use Miro, we use Figma and we do a lot of video calls. Yeah. You are that next generation remote first company that it's really awesome because you don't have any legacy and people <coughs> don't have to think of online as a second best option. It's actually the option. <laughs> exactly. So I, I, we never had that experience of like offline online and we've heard really that it's really difficult for people to be able to segregate after you've switched because people are still like want to work like they're in the office. We never had that problem, but even scaling by the way, and you're probably noticing it, scaling online is pretty difficult as well because async and sync, and you see how WordPress has done it. They've done it phenom phenomenally with, uh, you know, you have to like write a post almost at the end of each day at the start of each day. We're, we're very async, like we wanna do video calls and then we ended up having way too many meetings because everybody like, just for a, like a question, they're like, oh, let's set up a video call. And so the people are in meetings the whole day, <laughs> you know, over because uh, in real life, you can just tap someone on the shoulder and get back to work, if you know what I mean, if you have a question. So it is complex, yeah. It is. Um, something that I'm trying to pay more attention to these days is, is hiring people that have the right mindset to embrace online. Because I remember back in the day, 
working from home used to be a perk. It's like, okay, and then a lot of people will use it almost as an excuse to work less. Uh, not everyone, but definitely not everyone was ready to really work remote at a hundred percent or even more. And uh, now we are seeing this competitive advantage. Like now that everyone has to be working from home or almost everyone, now it's all about if you can really prove that you can be an A player like that and we can be trusted. And um, it's not easy and it also requires additional training and maintenance. But I think if you can find some of these people, it's really, really powerful because in a way that contributing to your culture, everyone is remote first, so there is no legacy. 100%. I, I completely agree with you on that. And it's really been a superpower for us as we've scaled this fast. Well, Johnny, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. Is there anything else you would like to share? Uh, yeah, I, we're looking for product managers now. We're looking for from up all, all the way from, you know, junior to the way uh, to, to VPs. So if you uh, if you want to apply, go ahead and apply. We're, we're super keen. Uh, you can find it on hopin.2 slash careers. That's, uh, by the way, yes, last question. I had to ask this, why dot T-O? Because dot com wasn't available, wink, wink. Something. <laughs> Something's changing now. <laughs> of course. Um, cool. Well, Johnny, look forward to chatting with you again. I think next time we chat, your guys are going to have one more zero uh, to your right. And I'm so happy for, for your growth. You truly have a great product. And I think that's the, that's the key for a successful company. So let's oh, keep it up. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on with you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.